Chapter 1, Amateur Radio, All About Operating. What is Amateur Radio? Amateur Radio, which is also commonly known as M Radio, is a hobby of constructing, experimenting, and communicating enjoyed by thousands of people all around the globe. To operate an amateur radio station in Malaysia, the operator must have an amateur radio operator's certificate and an apparatus assignment, AA, or a foreign amateur radio licensed from countries that have a reciprocal arrangement with Malaysia. A number of radio frequencies have been allocated for amateur radio usage where ham can communicate with each other across the city, state, country and even around the world all without the internet or cell phones. The integration between computer and amateur radio has also been increasing these days. For example, a transmission mode called Slow Scan Television SSTV, is a mode allowing the transmission and exchange of color images to other amateurs around the globe, while another transmission mode called Radio Teletype RTTY, is another mode which allows amateurs to have a contact in text form. Who can be hams? In general, anyone can be amateur radio operator which also known as ham. Young people find amateur radio a great training ground while older people find hamming as an absorbing retirement hobby. In fact, amateur radio is more than just a hobby. It is also a service that brings people, electronics, and communications together. Hams will provide their equipment and operating skills whenever the need arises such as for emergencies and rescue operations. Who reads this? This introduction to amateur radio is meant for all levels of hams, irrespective of their skill level or how long they have been operating, licensed. It's a simple introduction to amateur radio, ham radio and the activities associated with this hobby. The manual is not 100% comprehensive at which some of the information may need to be referred to other documents. Each section of this manual will introduce the various aspects of ham radio including basic terminologies, the ideas behind them and also why it is operated in that particular way. There may be specific equipment and, or technical know-how that is required and new terms of concept might be learned. 1. Newbies. If readers are new to this hobby, you'll find this introduction a wealth of information with regards to ham radio. Some of the activities you may have participated in or heard about, some may be totally foreign. It is advised to go through briefly the book in its entirety before reading each chapter or the chapter that interests you in detail. 2. Experienced hams. After operating for some time, you would have found the activity, activities that you like within ham radio operations. You would also find yourself expanding out to other modes, operations that you were not interested in earlier. If that is the case, you might need to refer to this introduction to find out more on those areas that now interest you. The information provided may not necessarily to make you an expert in the field, but it'll help you learn more about it. 3. Elmers. These days, ham operations have diversified so much that it is no longer possible for a person to be an expert in each mode, activity, new activity slash, modes of operations are developed continuously. Technological advances are transforming existing activities even to this day. Even if you are conversant in most activities, modes of operations, You'll find some new modes of operations, activities peculiar and probably need a refresher or reintroduction. Getting started. Various amateur radio clubs and societies around the country frequently carry out amateur radio examination preparation classes. Check out nearby local club, society's website, or Facebook page regularly for such announcements. It is recommended that those who are new to the hobby join one of these classes to get a better understanding and will help to prepare for the examination. Once you are ready, register yourselves for the Class C Radio Amateur Examination conducted by MCMC. Once you have sat and passed this examination, you can choose to either apply for a Class C Apparatus Assignment, AA, and operate under Class C privileges or continue taking the Class B Examination. If you pass the Class B Examination, you will be allowed to apply for a Class B AA and operate under Class B privileges instead. However, you will need to hold a valid Class BAA for at least one year before you are allowed to register and sit for the Class A examination. The reason for this is that Class A gives the license holder access to the low bands, microwave bands and higher transmission power. These, if handled by inexperienced amateurs will not only cause danger to the neighbors or people around you, but will also endanger yourself and might cause interference to commercial, aviation, public safety, government and other critical wireless services which might be life-threatening. The intention of this is really to protect the amateur and other critical wireless services. It was never intended to discourage one from progressing in the hobby. Where can I operate from? Licensed amateur radio operators are allowed to operate anywhere within Malaysian territories. 
The AA allows operator to operate either from base station, mobile or portable. Base station is defined by the address in the AA while mobile is defined by any station that is movable from one place to another. This includes setting up a station in vehicle or simply holding a handheld radio and walking around. A portable station is defined as a station away from the address stated in AA that is set up temporary and is not easily movable. This can include setting up a temporary station in another residence, setting up a field day station in the park or by the beach side, or simply operating from a temporary station in a hotel room during the vacation. Operating in foreign countries is also possible if the foreign country recognizes the Malaysian AA. The conditions for this could change from time to time and it is advisable to check with the foreign country's telecommunication authority or the National Amateur Radio Society on the prerequisites before attempting to operate aboard. In Malaysia, the National Amateur Radio Societies and clubs could also offer advice and supporting documents if required by the foreign country in order to obtain a local license. Please note that the operation at the common border area is subject to coordination with the neighboring countries within the coordination zones. Under no circumstances should an amateur operate in a foreign country if he or she does not have a valid amateur radio license from that country. The do and don't of amateur radio. A number of rules have been established to make amateur radio more enjoyable, fun, interesting and as a courtesy to others. It is must always remember that amateur radio operators consist of people from all walks of life, irrespective of their political beliefs, religion, race and etc. Today, with the introduction of linking repeaters and the opening of HF bands to more amateurs, the conversation might be heard throughout the country or even across the globe. Therefore, it is important that amateurs follow good and standard operating practice and be courteous to other amateurs at all times. As a courtesy to those who are already on the band, always listen first before attempting to transmit. This would avoid you stepping over other amateurs who might be already using the frequency or repeater. If you are not familiar with the operating procedures, do spend some time to listen to other conversations first before transmitting. Discussions pertaining but not limited to politics, religion, race, sex, harassment are strictly forbidden in amateur radio. Always keep in mind that one should avoid any other sensitive topics too that could cause discomfort or affect the feelings of other amateurs. Any radio checks or tests that need to be carried out should be done by connecting the radio and transmitting into a dummy load instead of on the air. This is to minimize interference and disturbance to other amateurs. Another important aspect of practice is to leave a few seconds pause between overs. This practice which is not only limited to repeater but also simplex operation which is to allow others to join in the conversation and allow those who are in emergency or priority traffic to seek assistance. Do always bear in mind that emergency and priority traffic always have the highest priority over all other traffic. Amateurs are required to render help to any station in a life-threatening or distress station that they come across whenever possible. In repeater operation, particularly with linked repeaters, one should always wait a split second before talking after keying PTT to ensure that all repeaters that make up the linking system have fully keyed up. Failure to do so might cause the first few words of the conversation to be lost especially on a distance repeater. Allowing a few seconds pause between conversations will also help to allow all repeaters fully stop transmitting first before the next users keys up the links. Remember that all other amateurs will appreciate good and courteous operation and it goes a long way. Antenna safety. Whichever antenna that operators decide to use, please have them installed safely. Do not endanger own life or someone else's in the pursuit of hobby. 1. Keep the antenna and its support clear of any overhead power lines. This includes the incoming power supply to the own home, station. 2. Ensure that should the antenna or its support or mast falls, fails, it will not have any contact with any overhead power lines. 3. Installation of the antenna must not be easily contacted by people as RF. Radiation may cause harm. These points on antenna safety are thoroughly elaborated in the following chapters of this introduction. Amateur radio bands. The frequency bands for amateur radio service are allocated on primary and secondary service allocation in the spectrum plan issued by MCMC. The principles for primary and secondary services are as follows. 1. The operations of primary services are given priority as compared to the operations of secondary services. 2. The operations of secondary services shall ensure that no interference is caused to any of the primary services. 3. The operations of secondary services shall not claim protection from any of the primary services to which frequencies have been assigned or may be assigned to at a later date. 4. 
The operations of secondary services may, however, claim protection from interference caused by other secondary services. And 5. There there are more than one primary services in the same frequency. Band, service providers shall abide to a coordination process as mentioned in the relevant administrative documents or guidelines issued by MCMC from time to time. For further information on the frequency bands, please refer to the guidelines for amateur radio service in Malaysia and Spectrum Plan and MCMC website. Below are the summary of the most popular operating amateur radio bands in Malaysia. 1. 23 cm, 1240, 1300 MHz, band, secondary service allocation. At the top end of the frequency range, the antenna sizes are very small in comparison. As the frequency reduces, the bandwidth increases and so does the antenna sizes. As the size of the antenna is small, operators can use an antenna with a very high gain, 20, 30 decibels gain, that will fit into car boot lid or car roof. Comparatively a larger antenna of 10 meters bandwidth may only offer a 10 decibels gain. Operating on ultra high frequency, UHF, will provide good penetrative power and works well inside buildings. However, it will have a much shorter range given the same power of transmission. 2. 70 cm, 430 MHz, 440 MHz, band, secondary service allocation. This band is used mainly on mobile and handheld sets. It offers better penetrative power when compared to the 2 meters band. It's ideal for use indoors although the range is limited. It is normally used within large cities and the range can be extended via the use of a repeater system or a linking repeater system. The sets are very compact and normally mobile or handheld sets. 3. 2 meters, 144, 148 MHz, band, primary service allocation. This is by far the most common and popular band in use by ham radio operators. Most repeater systems or a linking repeater systems use this band. The sets are very compact and normally mobile or handheld sets. Unlike the 70 cm bandwidth, the range for 2 meter sets can go up to a few kilometers simply by using 5 watts and upwards of 20 kilometers when using higher power, point to point through varying terrain. Repeater systems installed on high elevated locations that are transmitting on 25 watts can reach up to 100 kilometers or much more, depending on the height of the repeater antenna. 4. 6 meters, 50, 54 megahertz, band, primary service allocation. This band is by far the most interesting amateur radio band. It's also known sometimes as the magic band. When solar activity is high, one can communicate with another person 1000 kilometers or more. When solar activity is low, even a few kilometers is not possible on SSB. One can also use FM mode on this band that is not dependent on solar activities. A few, tens of kilometers range is possible depending on the power of transmission utilized. There are some handheld, mobile radios with 6 meters capabilities but these are rare. 5. 10 meters, 28, 29.7 megahertz, band, primary service allocation. On years of high solar activities, 10 watts of power will be good enough to contact pretty much anyone throughout the globe. On the other hand, low solar activity will render this band sporadic with openings only at certain times of the day and only for short periods of time. SSB activities are normally centered between 28.3 MHz and 28.5 MHz. CW activities can be found below 28.3 MHz down to the band edge with digital operations between 28.070 MHz and 28.120 MHz. FM and AM operations are normally conducted above 29.0 MHz. 6. 7 m, 18.068, 18.168 MHz, 15 m, 21, 21.45 MHz, and 12 m, 24.89, 24.99, megahertz, bands, primary service allocation. Again, there is high solar activity phrase being used. These three bands also depend very much on this phenomenon. The 15 meters band tends to be more crowded and popular compared to the 17 meters and 12 meters. When the propagation is good and the bands are open, operators will be able to have QSOs nonetheless as there will be activities on whatever band that is open. After all, whether the bands are crowded or less so, operators only can work one station at a time. 7. 20 meters, 14, 14.35 megahertz, band, primary service allocation. Known as the workhorse band of ham radio, 
The 20 meters band is perhaps one of the most popular and most utilized band for amateur radio. Even during periods of low solar activity, the 20 meters band is still usable in one or another part of the work in one direction or another. A wide variety of activities or modes are used on this band from SSB voice to CW and other digital operations such as PSK, RTTY and SSTV. It is one of the easiest bands to work on. During low solar activity, signals may be weaker but still readable nonetheless over several hours in a day. All hours of the day may be possible during periods of high solar activity. 8. 30 meters, 10.1, 10.15 megahertz, secondary service allocation and 40 meters, 7.0, 7.2 megahertz, band, primary service allocation. Between 30 meters and 40 meters bands, the former is not as crowded as the latter. The reason being the skip distance being a little more when compared to 40 meters and also the accessibility. Nonetheless, it is still used whenever propagation is good and the band is open. For 40 meters, it is widely used in this part of the world. Very popular amongst hams in neighboring Indonesia, the band is in use throughout the day and night so long as conditions are right for the band to be open. It is not surprising to find this band so crowded that one cannot find a spot to park and call CQ. Ragchus can be found every few khz between stations that they sometimes drown out other DX stations from Europe, Oceania, and the Americas. 9. 60 meters, 5.3515. 5.3665 MHz, band, secondary service allocation. This band is unique in the sense that it uses a channelized system. Users are to use the middle frequency of the channel. Apart from that, users are only secondary users meaning that this band is being shared with a primary user, who has priority of use over him radio users. The other restriction is that users may only transmit 15 watts ARP instead of 1000 watts PEP as allowed in other HF bands. ARP means the output from the antenna as opposed to the input into the antenna. An example of ARP means that if the antenna has a gain of 3 decibels, the power input into the antenna permissible may only be 7.5 watts PEP. 10. 80 meters, 3.5, 3.9 megahertz, and 160 meters, 1.8, 2.0 megahertz, bands, primary service. Allocation. Known as the top bands, they are less popular with hams this part of the world probably due to the antenna size, dipole length. Nonetheless, it is also used whenever propagation is good especially during contests as there will be contesters trying to rake up multipliers to improve their scoring. These two bands tend to be susceptible to interference especially if one is operating in populated areas as neon lighting adds to the noise on the bands. Coordinated Universal Time Explained Coordinated Universal Time, UTC is used not only in ham radio but a wide variety of other activities such as flight operations and etc. The theory of UTC being used is that there will be no misunderstanding of the time used in recording QSOs as well as communications between stations as one station may not know the time zone of the other station that he, she is communicating with. Thus the reference to UTC will not cause any confusion. In Malaysia, the local time is UTC plus 8 meaning to say that if the local time is 4 p.m., the UTC time shall be 8 a.m. or 8 o'clock hours UTC. In ham operations, it is normal to use the 24-hour time format as this leads to less confusion. Similarly, dates used are also based on the UTC time. An example of this would be that at 4 a.m. on 2nd May MST, Malaysian Standard Time, the corresponding UTC time would be 20 hundred hours hours on 1st May, i.e. 8 hours behind. Another peculiarity with the 24-hour time format is that 0 o'clock is also interchangeable with 2400 hours as one signifies the beginning of a day and the other, the end of a day, which coincidentally is the same time. In some countries, there is the occurrence of daylight savings time whereby the clock is set forward an hour to lengthen the evening sunset time. Please note that this has no effective UTC time as this remains the same as all refer to the same time which does not change. QSL Cards QSL card is an age-old tradition in ham radio operations. The exchange of QSLs is enjoyable and fun. They can also serve as a sometimes much need confirmation for the qualification of a great many operating awards on offer. As the world and technology progresses, electronic QSL systems are now abound but hams will probably still continue to exchange QSL cards especially after an initial first-time contact. There are many ready-made QSL cards. Alternatively, Operator may want to print their own and personalize the cards. 
Some use readily available software while some have them professionally designed and printed. Whatever way it may, the most important thing is that the QSO information is contained on the card that is important. A standard QSL card should be 3.5 inches by 5.5 inches, standard postcard size, and should contain the following information whether printed or written on. Permanent ink should be used to ensure it doesn't fade over time or with exposure to light. Your call, this is operator's call sign. Should be portable or mobile, this should be indicated on the card along with operator's actual location when the contact was made. The geographical location of operator station, as indicated earlier, if the station were portable or mobile, this should be indicated on the card along with operator's actual location when the contact was made. If operator's location will count towards a ward such as island on the air, IOTA, include that information as well. The grid locator which is the 6 character grid square should be included. The call of remote station, this refers to the call sign of the station that operators contacted. As this is normally written by hand, please ensure that operator's handwriting is legible and not confusing. IA number 1, 1, small letter L, L, capital I, I, can be misread or misinterpreted. Date and time of contact, as far as possible. Use UTC time and date as this will make it less confusing. Operators can use the local time, Zulu time, but they should indicate what it is in relation to UTC, i.e. Malaysia is UTC plus 8 o'clock. Keep it simple is the motto so just use UTC time. Frequency, the band that operators were working on when they made the contact in either wavelength, meters, or approximate frequency in KHZ or megahertz is the minimum required. Some people indicate the exact frequency and that is also acceptable. Mode of operation. This is the mode that the contact was made on. Please use the correct abbreviation, IECW, SSB, RTTY, PSK31, AM, FM etc. Emission designation, IE fee etc. May not be widely understood by people. Signal report. Use the RS system, or RST system if in CW etc. To indicate. Do leave no doubt that it was a two-way QSO by indicating as such on operator's QSL card. Should operators make a mistake whilst filling up their QSL card, do not cross it out and rewrite it. This is unacceptable especially for award claim. Destroy the card and start fresh. Cards can be sent directly to the contact via obtaining the contact's mailing address online through websites such as QRZ or via Bureau. Normally if sent directly to the contact, Operators should enclose a self-addressed stamped envelope, SASE. This ensures that the contact will reply at his, her earliest convenience.